Thank everyone. Um, first of all, I am not a Geordie. I don't know if anybody knows anything about the North East, but it's, a, it's quite a big place. Um, so I'm a little bit further south. I'm from uh, the mining villages in County Durham. And believe it or not, we're called Yakas. Pit Yakas. So there's a little bit of their information. Um, I'm not too sure that Chris actually thinks a lot of you put me on first, talking about systems and procedures. I think some of you are going to be asleep by about half eleven. But um, I'll try and do my very best to try and make it as engaging as I possibly can. When you do talk about systems and procedures, it is a little bit of a snooze fest. Um, one thing I'd really, really encourage is please can you ask questions if you're not sure about it? Because it is quite a court really complicated subject and if we skip past a couple of things that you don't understand, you really will be sitting there for the next 20 minutes thinking, what the hell's he on about? So just pop your hand up, we'll ask questions, we'll try and get through the information as, as quick as we can. Um, but take as many notes, ask as many questions. I'm here all day, so if you've got anything you either didn't understand my accent about, or you didn't understand in general, just pull us to one side and we can go through it. Is that fair enough, yeah? Yeah. Awesome. So who am I? So glad to see so many familiar faces and we're, we're connected on Facebook, but if you don't know who I am, as Chris said, MD of Castledean. So we've been going about nine years now, seems about 90, uh, but we've got six branches, um, open up our seventh beginning of the year. We've got offers in on another eight. Uh, one being a single branch, which we hopefully will be completing in the next three or four weeks, and a big seven branch here up in Northumberland that will be completing ideally before Christmas. Uh, Manage 2,000 houses and 350 let on lease. Just coincidentally, if those uh, businesses that we've put the offers in um, complete will be pretty much close to 3,000 properties under, under management. Um, 45 staff um, sell over 300 properties a year. And just remember, we're, we're a letting agent who's turned into sales, so we're just starting now trying to get a little bit of traction with our uh, sales process. But again, if we do take over these other businesses, we'll be about 1,500 properties a year in, in sales. So it's going to be quite a big operation. But the best thing is, I don't get involved in the running of the business. I can do cool stuff like come down and speak to you today. So that has not been overnight. It's taken me nine years to be an overnight success, as I say. Um, and it's been the first five years I worked my ass off systemizing the business. 60 hours a week to me was a part-time job. I really did put the, put the hours in. And I know I do post quite early in the morning, um, but literally at five, half five, my phone's off and I'm, I'm with the kids and with my family time. So although I get up early and you might see me posting very stupid o'clock in the morning thinking, does that lad ever sleep? It is generally because I'm an early riser, but I'd, I'd like spending time with my family on an evening. So just to give you a flavour about uh, who I am, also about some of the things we've achieved in business. So top left was in 2014 when we won uh, Sunday Times Letting the Agency of the Year Awards. And that was quite pleasing because Countrywide had just floated for three quarters of a billion a couple of months before and we beat them in the second place. Um, so what was pretty cool was going past their 20 tables with five of us for, like the clampets from the northeast, <laughs> half pissed on red wine, going to collect the trophy and getting the daggers in the back of our head. So that was pretty, uh, pretty good experience. Bottom left is my, my uh, MD Adele, and you know we'll talk about creating that leader in your business. And she's the leader of my business, and she she runs the operations. Um, and that was when we won the uh, best in the north. We won that the last four years, which is again very happy about that achievement. The top right. Now that's the first time in my life I was actually stuck for words, because that was when I was awarded the uh, outstanding contribution to Lettons um, at, at those awards in 2015. So we we won the best in the north. We didn't get through to the best in the country. So I just decided, like any good pit lad, I just decided to get on it. So I started drinking the pints, thinking great, and then it's the last award at the end of the day. I said, oh, can John Paul come up? Blah blah blah. So that's why I'm half cut and half shocked <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. Um, but one of the most important things, and one of the most pleasing awards, accreditations, whatever you want to call it, that I'm, I'm most happy about is the Investors and People Gold Award. So that's something that I'm a real big passionate believer in as your staff. Systems are great, and, and you know, coming all the processes and the procedures are great, but if you don't develop and train your staff to be the best version of themselves, systems are a waste of time. You're wasting your time and you're wasting their time. So when we decided to go for the investors and people, um, it was either that or um, ISO. Has anybody heard of ISO 9000? It's a quality standard. It's basically systems, but you get a nice little kill badge at the end of it. So when we spoke with the managers, we said, right, we've got two options now, guys. We can go for ISO, we 
we get a nice little badge, or we can go for investors and people, and we get a nice little badge. When I explained a little bit about what ISO was, they said, well, we do it anyway, so why, what's the advantages of getting a badge for something we already do? So we decided to go for IIP, or investors and people. And it was literally the best decision we ever made. It really did make us step up a level in terms of the way we operated. It standardised everything in terms of our HR and our training development with the staff. And it was a difficult process because we lost, in the first six months to a year, we lost about 25% of our staff. And that wasn't a bad thing. I'm happy about that, by the way. It wasn't at the time because we had to go on a recruitment drive. But the point was that our staff wasn't right for the business and our business wasn't right for them, the direction that we were taking them. And that left us with some holes, um, some gaps to plug. But we recruited well, we recruited wisely, and that is a major, major reason why we are uh, it's quite successful today. So your staff are everything. It's not going to form part of the talk, but if you can put systems in place to help benefit you as a business, but also your staff, then you're onto a winner. So a tenant fee ban. Who's a little bit nervous about it coming in? Not many. Oh, brilliant. Um, I'm a bit nervous. Who's, who's, got, who's not going to be nervous about losing part of your turnover? It's not going to really affect us a massive amount because of where we operate and the amount we charge. But it'd be lying to say if I didn't want to lose 7% of my turnover. But the point is, if you have systems in your business, it can make you more efficient, more effective. The tenant fee ban won't affect you as much. So the three things we're doing in the business is we're, we're making ourselves more efficient systems and we're acquiring businesses and we're also increasing our income. And for me, you need to do all three. Well, not buy businesses, that's our, our sort of remit. But if you can, then it's a good way to sort of increase the income. Look at the income streams, but also look at efficiency. There's a study by Harvard Business Review that says five to one. If you can um, make it takes five times, five pound to make a pound as opposed to one pound to save a pound. So it's five times more difficult to make income than to currently save it. So why go through all that effort and stress of increasing your income if you've already got the ability to make yourself more efficient? And systems will help do that. Quick question, show of hands. Who's got a business and who thinks they're self-employed? Who thinks they've got a business, first of all? Who thinks they're self-employed? Thank you for being honest. And there is a difference between the two, and it's my definition to a trade. Go away for three months and see what happens. You're not allowed your phone, you're not allowed access to emails, you're not allowed to speak to anyone from the office. And if you come back, and that's happened, you've gained more business, everything's running efficient, the tenants have paid the rent, chance would be a fine thing. The contractors aren't twisting, they've turned for jobs. It's absolutely running smoothly, then you've got a well and truly organised systems business. If you come back and it's like that, then you're, you're self-employed. You know, the tenants haven't paid the rent, the staff haven't turned up, sickness rates increased, then you are, you're just self-employed. And there's no right or wrong, by the way, I'm not criticising, because for a long time I was self-employed. You just need to recognise where you are because you need to know where you are in order to change the dynamic of your business. You can't go from self-employed to employed, sorry, self-employed to a business if you already think you're there. So if anybody has been away for two weeks and you're constantly checking your phone, you've only gone away for two weeks with the family, and you're constantly checking your phone or emails are coming through and you know, the kids are playing by the pool and you've got to go off into a dark room to talk to the staff, you're just self-employed. Nothing more than that. So the pain of not being systemised. So if anybody, of you, any of you have worked long hours, not seen family or no holidays, demotivated staff. So systems are the, the best way to retain and help grow your staff. If you haven't got systems, you're getting a lot of, I thought he was doing it, that's her job. No, he said he was going to do that. It's going to have demo demotivating factors on your, on your staff and they will leave. We've had lots of staff leave before we got systems. <coughs> and even when we first started systemising the business, we weren't doing it in a very, we weren't doing it in the correct manner. So we did have people leave because of that. And again, we've just got to recognise why people are leaving. A lot of, I don't know if a lot of you do exit interviews when they leave, excuse me, but when you sit down with the staff, you tend to get a lot more honest open feedback from them then. What you'd prefer to see is, I wish you'd done that the last two or three years on your, your monthly one-to-ones, but it never works like that. It's just all of a sudden they seem to grow eight foot tall when they're, when they're leaving the business. Um, and a lot of our feedback was, you know, there's a lot of crossover in the systems, there's a lot of crossover in what people's job roles. So having the correct systems and writing them in the correct way will help motivate the staff. 
poor customer service. As again, if you've got staff coming in and out because they're demotivated, they don't give a monkeys about the job, you know, gaps and holes in your business, who's going to suffer? It's going to be the customer. It's going to be our landlords and it's also going to be our tenants or vendors if you're into sales. You're not going to have that consistency of service. They're going to leave and there's only so many times you can go back to the same landlord or the same tenant saying, look, we screwed up, we messed up. Come on, what can we do to gain your loyalty back? What can we do to earn your trust back? You spend time firefighting. I don't know about you, but I used to go to the office, think I was going to get on with a full day, plan my full week out, open my emails and there was complaints. Staff, landlords, tenants, whatever it was, I was getting a lot of issues and I couldn't get on with the day stuff. I couldn't get on with the ideas, the strategies I had, you know, the, the, the big vision that I wanted to implement in the business because all I was doing was mopping up the crap of, of everybody in the business. Is anybody else going through that at the moment? Yeah, it's a real problem. It's a real, real life problem. But you can do something about it. But as my old man used to say, you don't know what you don't know. It's when do you start? What, at what point do you draw a line across it? And say, right, that's the past. Moving forward, this is what's going to happen. The staff's going to get on board. We're going to roll out the vision. We're going to roll out the values of the company. And this is where we're going to take the business. You've got to get the bus going in the right direction. You've got to get the right bums in the right seats. Systems will help you do that. Less profit. Who got into business to earn more money? <laughs> exactly. Systems are going to help you earn more money. It's not a surprise that when we implement our systems, our net profit percentage started to rise quite dramatically because of the systems. We had the same staff. They were getting better at the job. They were doing the same thing over and over again. Has anybody read a book called The Talent Code? Awesome book. Read it. Daniel Coyne, I think is his name. I'm a bit of a nerd on this sort of stuff, as some of you might know, and he writes about a process called myelinization. And what it effectively means is, in the brain, you've got synapses, and it goes from left to right, and that's, that's the impulses. And what that does is that fires into your muscles and it makes you do something. It's a process called myelinization, which means the more you do something, the better you get at it. And there's, a, there's a, like a white sheath, an insulation that forms around the nerves that makes you, the, the pulse go quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. So if any of you's played football before, or rugby, or, or sport of any description, and you see an old guy on the pitch, and he just seems to have all the time in the world. You're going in for a tackle, and he turns and he just passes the ball. Or if it's rugby, he just seems to have all the time in the world. He doesn't. He's got the same amount of time as you. He's just been in that position so many times, he thinks of what he's got to do straight away. He gets the ball, and he knows he's got to pass it. It's the same with systems. If you're doing the same job over and over and over and over again, it becomes second nature. So it's not just me sitting up here saying it's a mindset shift, it's neurologically and biologically a fact that if you do the same job and the same thing over and over again, I via systems, you will get better at it, you'll get more efficient, you get more effective, and if you're efficient and you're effective, you're going to make more money. That's not me. Right? So I'm uh, from a little place called Easington. And if anybody's seen Billy Elliot where it was filmed, that's, that's Easington. <clears throat> it's a bit of a shithole, if I'm honest. <laughs> However, that's where I'm from. That's where I'm, I'm proud to be, working class and proud. My dad was a miner, my granddad was a miner, and my kids are the first generation that no one's been down the pit or works in heavy engineering. So when I say I'm working class, pretty much you can't get any more working class than me. Um, so, but I'm very proud of that fact, very proud of where I come from. And I do, when I do talks like this, I do say, you know, that's where I'm from. Um, but my dad had an engineering company. There's a point to this, so just bear with us. Um, my dad had an engineering company, worked his way out from the mines, got, got himself out of there. He was only in about three or four years. And started doing work for the mines, believe it or not. So we couldn't get away from the mining industry. Um, about 16, 17 years ago, he employed about 45 people, quite a, quite a decent sized business. Um, he got me and my brother in. I'd been playing rugby in the morning and brother came in. He said, son, um, I've got cancer. We were like, don't worry, Dad, you're going to be fine. Because my mum had had cancer a few years before, breast cancer, and she'd been there. She says, no, no, this is, this is it. I've, uh, I haven't got long left. And we said, well, how long is long? He said, probably about nine months to a year. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fire sale the business. I'm just going to get rid of it. Um, and we're going to set your mum up for life. And you're going to be set up. You know, we'll put you in a nice little house, business, car, a little bit of money in the bank, whatever you want, you and your brother. Um, and you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. So not only was, you know, you hearing your dad's going to pass away, the last thing in your mind is money. I promise you, it's the last thing you want to think about. But he was thinking about his kids and his family and his wife. You know, much respect to him for, for doing that. 
Two weeks later, um, he slipped into a coma, and two days after that, he died. And that was all because um, they took a biopsy to see how long he truly had left, and he, he got an infection and he passed away very quickly. Now, as if that wasn't enough, you know, we devastated. It was my dad, my best friend. Um, three months after that, because he wasn't in the business, uh, the business went bust, and we lost a lot. So bear in mind, my dad sent me to private school, my brother to private school, we had cars, we had a really good lifestyle, big house. It was really, you know, very fortunate to come from where I came from. Um, however, we lost a lot, absolutely everything. Company went bust, my dad had guaranteed some of the machinery, so they came after my mum for the insurance. It was a real messy affair, and we were left devastated and had to start again. Now, if there was one thing I could say that the reason that we lost the business it was systems. And bearing in mind, he had ISO 9001. So when you talk about a systemized business, he was systemized, it was just written in the wrong way. It was written that he was integral to the business. So when the business, when my dad died, the business died with him. There's no one there to sign the checks. There's no one there to do the meetings. There's no one there to, the relationships with Caterpillar, because he did a lot of work with the, um, that type of uh, engineering. There was nothing left other than to fold the business. There was no one could run it. So when we talk about the hit by a bus scenario, it'll never happen to me. It happened to me. Absolutely, it is a real life thing that can happen to every single person in this room. And touch wood and God forbid it never does. But do you know when you say, right, I need to, I need to systemize the business, but it's actually not that much of a priority. I'll put it to one side. Because do you know what? Hit by a bus scenario will never happen to me. Hopefully that story, I don't want to depress the friggin' room here, by the way. <laughs> I can see there's people getting the hankies out and all sorts. Um, and I don't mean to depress the room, but I just want to give you a real life indication of when something, there's a phrase, bad shit happens to good people. That, that's exactly what happened to us. So it's a real life scenario that can happen to, to you in this room. So systems are very glossy and they're very buzzword at the moment. But I really, really urge you that if you're going to systemize the business, please, please, please just do it. Exactly what Chris said earlier on about execution. Absolutely execute it. So whatever you hit here today or you see my videos or you, you read the books or whatever, if you've got the ability to put systems into your business, do, do it from day one. Because I do not want what happened to us to happen to you guys. But that's the main driver why I am very passionate about systems. Because I didn't want what happened to me and my family, um, sorry, yeah, my mum and us to happen to my kids. So hence why I'm really, really passionate about systems, procedures, developing the leader-centric business, you know, engaging with your staff, giving them, they say I, I, I'd abdicate everything, but I'm not, it's delegating, that's the way I look at it. Um, but you've got to sort of trust them and let them run with the business. So the power of systems, time to spend with the family. One caveat, you must like your family. There's, there's no point going away with them if you're not too keen on them. Um, motivating accountable staff, brilliant. Imagine they're, they're getting the business in, they're telling you, you know, what's working well, what's not working well. They're coming and giving you feedback, they're getting the business, they're doing all sorts. What an amazing business that would be. Increased profit, again, you're going to get, you know, the better you get, the more efficient, the slicker you get, you are going to make more money. That is just a fact. I do not know a single successful businessman who's got systems in his business, who hasn't, when he put systems in his business, started to make more money. I just think it's a fallacy. You put systems in your business, you'll become more profitable. Happy customers referral. So much easier to get a phone call saying, oh, so-and-so said you were really good, can you give him a business, than advertising on right move and XYZ property portals and, and what have you. It's easy, it's cheap, it's the best form of um, you know, advertising. If anybody's read a book called Raven Fans uh, by Ken Blanchard, that's the type of type of people you want. You don't want customers, you want raving fans. A little bit how in the North East everybody talks about Sunderland and Newcastle, God knows why at the minute, but anyway. People talk about them with such passion. I'm a Newcastle supporter, I'm a Sunderland supporter. They're the best things since sliced bread. That's what they want. You want your raving fans to talk about your business and promote your business. And it's an easy life. You know, if you've got your staff doing all the hard work, that means you don't have to do a lot of hard work. You know, I'm, I'm really passionate about growing my business. I've got a big vision, a big plan, and that's what I'm working on. So I'm looking at the, talking to the business owners. Most of them are not selling at the minute because they want to ride out the next couple of months. But for every five, 10 I'm talking to, one's actually saying, do you know what? We're interested in, in talking about selling. Can we have a coffee? Can we have a chat to see uh, what you can offer us? 
And there's a lot of business out there, people want to, to go down the acquisitions route. But systems will allow you to have the time to spend on that, because it is quite a lengthy and, and complicated process. Systems gives you a saleable asset. Don't know about you, I don't want to be in this business forever. I'm actually not that keen on lettings, if I'm honest. I like business. I started off as a landlord, I morphed into a letting agent, and then I've morphed into a business person, businessman. That's where I think my strength is. Um, but I want to sell at some point in the future. I've got a big plan, a big vision, where I want to go to, where I want to take the business. Um, but if I'm integral to the business, that will not have a value. We've bought and sold quite a number of businesses, about 10 or 11 at the minute, and we're, we're acquiring more. I can categorically tell you from somebody that's actually doing the do, walking the walk, that we've never paid full price for a business that hasn't got systems in. The cheapest business I bought was a quid in Halifax, because there's no systems in. And I said, I won't have that given, but I'll give you a quid. <laughs> and we got it. And we sold it 18 months later for 60,000 pounds because we systemized the business and then sold it to a, a competitor. That's the power of system, so I can't even work out the ROI on that, I'm crap at maths. However, you just imagine you can do that with your business. Now that's an extreme example. That's not gonna happen every time. But every business we look at, the first thing we do is can we have job descriptions of everybody? Can we have, we, we process map out everybody's journey within the business, and you don't tell them straight away that you'd offer less money for them if they're integral to the business, but you say, oh, so what do you do in the business? And as business owners, we're a bit bullshit and we like to tell we do everything and we just let them talk and we're listening and saying, that's not 20 grand off your price, that's not 30,000 pound off your price. And we let them just talk and talk and talk to find out, are they integral to the business? Systems in the business, you take a step out, you, you can command a higher price. So a few years ago, we were talking, and the strategy will have changed now, but we we're talking countrywide about a potential acquisition. And we speak, within the first five minutes, I knew that we couldn't do a deal. They wanted far too much for the business. But we spoke to the, the lady there, the Acquisitions and Mergers Director, and she said, if you are systematic, if you're integral to the business, we might not even offer. But if you are, we might offer five to seven to eight times the profit. If you're not integral to the business and you, you're far removed, we'll at least double that offer, at least. Because what they don't want to do is, let's be honest, all our business isn't here. You know, yes, we've got the brand and some of us have got offices, we've got all the nice IP. It can be put on a memory stick. Our business is our data and our, our staff, I get that. But the majority of our customers are held on a, on a USB stick. And the bigger companies who are acquiring don't want any risk to their investment. So that's why if you're integral to the business, you could just put it on a memory stick and start up um, next door, you know, a month, two, two years down the line, whenever you, your non-compete clauses are finished. Is that all right so far, any questions? Please silence. So there's five steps to systemizing a business. If you think you're writing an operations manual and you're systemized, you're absolutely wrong. There's, that's 20% of the way through the entire process. There's five elements to it. Operations manual, we're, we're gonna go through all of these by the way. Um, Chris, are we okay, if, if anybody wants the slides, are we okay to fire them out after the event? Cool. So take photos if you want, but we'll get the slides to you. So operations manual, it is the hardest part or the most time consuming part of the systemization process, but is, you need to start somewhere. So writing your manual is the first step. You've then got to train the staff on the manual. What's the point of having a manual if nobody's read it? So we'll talk a little bit about training and development. You've then got to audit the manual, or audit the processes, and this is, in my opinion, the most underutilized part of the entire system, because people will write the manual, they'll train the staff, and then they'll take a step back, and when they ship it to the fan, they'll wonder why. Right. If you audit your business on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, you get to find out what's going right or what's going wrong in the business. And also, from a staff point of view, they know that somebody's watching over your shoulder. Human nature dictates if nobody's watching, you find the easiest route. Isn't it? Is there, if anybody's got kids here and you tell them not to do something, then you walk out the room and they go in and they do it anyway. But if you're stood over the top of them, my kids will do it anyway, but normal kids won't, won't actually do it. Feedback. You've got to feed back the results of the audit. You've carried out the audit, brilliant, and then you put it in a cupboard and you don't do anything with it. Waste of time, you're wasting their time, you're wasting your time. Feed back the information of the audit. It's the only way people improve. And we'll talk about the right way and the wrong way to give um, feedback. Has anybody, anybody heard of a shit sandwich before? <laughs> Seagull management? Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, and then review. 
It's either a people issue or it's a person issue, a people issue or a process issue. And if it's a person issue, it's a skill or a will. And we'll talk about how to define that as well. So operations manual. So how to write the operations manual? You need to write an idiot's guide. I know it's not politically correct to call it idiot's guide, but you, do, you need to. You need to write it in such a manner that you take into account who will be reading this. So if you've got apprentices or you've got um, first level sales negotiators or letters negotiators, don't use corporate terminology, don't use KPIs, metrics and engagement and strategy and words that they might actually struggle with, write it in plain English. Make sure they can understand their job role within the business. You've got to think of that if anybody comes into your business, God forbid what happened to, to my family, somebody else has to understand the procedures and the, the operations manual. So I'll write it in plain English to the lowest common denominator. But the, the, the main focus of learning objectives is just that when you read the objectives, has, has all the objectives been answered in the process? So it all make sense? Again, deathly silence. <laughs> um, write it with customer service in mind. Do not write it how you currently operate your business. Write it how you would like to operate your business. This is the perfect chance to change your business to be the business you want it to be. So if that means chopping and changing current processes and procedures to make you more efficient, more effective, this is the perfect opportune time to do it. If you are, I don't know, if you're taking 48 hours to respond to an email and you know that's pretty crappy customer service, put in, I will respond within an eight hour period. Change your processes and procedures to operate how you want. Now this is where you might get a little bit of kickback from your staff. And this is when we systemised the business, we got a bit of kickback. Because it's like, the thing I really hate is, it's always been done like that. That's the way we've always done it. It really pees me off. So when we did it, we said, no, no, that's the way you did it, and that's why we were shite. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to improve the business. And we got a little bit of kickback, and some people left the business. And as I said, that's fine. We're not right for everybody, and everybody's not right for us. But this is the perfect time to write your plan, write your business um, procedures with customer service. Write them with smart and pure. So smart, have we all heard of specific, measurable, agreed, realistic, time bound? Yeah, very important. Specific, be very, very specific, granular detail. You know, the sales negotiator will do this. The sales, within a 24 hour period, form five, appendix X, whatever it is. Be very, very specific. So if anything goes wrong in your business, something's missed, missed out, you can go back to the procedure and say, did you do it? It's a yes or it's a no. If it's a no, then we need to do training. If it's a yes, then great, fantastic. The audits, you know, it's back to you up what you did. Pure is positively stated, understood, realistic and ethical. Right, so positively stated, use positive language. You will do this. Not like if you've got time, I feel as though you should do this. I believe this is the right way to do it. Write it with positive intent. It's the same as if you're having a one-to-one -one with somebody, you wouldn't say, I think you've had a really crap month. I can't back it up, but I just get this gut feeling you haven't performed. What will your staff member do? Absolutely shred you to bits. It's the same with the written word. Make sure you're very positive, um, positively stated. Understood, obviously. Realistic as well. Don't say I'm going to return a phone call in 30 seconds. And ethical. Now that should go without saying. However, there's a client of ours who actually basically said in a written manual, if you don't pay your rent, send the lads round. Seriously. He wasn't a client for much longer after that. But, but he said, you can't bloody put that in writing, but he did. But anyway, so make sure, we're all here, we're all ethical and responsible agents, but we've just got to bear that in mind. Make sure we understand the legislation and the law in our business. And adapt and evolve and change. Once you write this, this is an ongoing process. You will never, ever, ever finish your manual. It's literally like the fourth bridge. As soon as you get to the end, you're going to have to redo parts of the process again. And that is legislation changes, as you grow your business, as you introduce technology, as all technology goes out, you will be adapting and evolve the business. So just make sure that when you do this, this is a, it's a lifelong commitment. You'll be married to the operations manual longer than your wife or husband, I promise you. Sorry, I'll again. Um, well, no, go for it. Smart, you kind of glossed over that, I've never heard of it. Sorry, apologies, apologies. Specific, measurable, agreed, realistic and time bound. So when you write specific, it's exactly what it says. Very, very specific about who does what, when, why, how. Measurable, make sure that if an action or a process is carried out, that you can measure was it carried out within that given time frame. Agreed, everybody agrees it. 
um, realistic, sort of, you know, it's possible, and then time out sort of relates back to the measurable that everybody can do it within a set time frame. Thank you. Training. Yeah, positively stated, understood, realistic, which is the R on smart as well, and ethical. We have got a procedure, how to write a procedure. Yeah, and then we write it all down. Because we, our staff now, we've sort of given them more of a job role. So that we, because we were finding, like you said, everyone was doing a bit of everything. And then they'd say, well, I thought they were doing it. They'd say, no, she told me she'd do it. And yeah. there, there was no um, sort of ownership. Yeah, of accountability, yeah. Especially when it's going wrong. Yeah. Um, so we've given everyone job roles now. So you, as a business owner, you do the whole manual. Then you sort of say this section really is covers your job, that sort of thing. So yeah, actually, I'll take it back one step further. Sort of, I've lived and breathed this for five or six years, so apologies if I skip over stuff. Just put your hands up and I'll, I'll go back. So, the, where I would start was um, identify in your business all the processes. So, like have an index, and you start at the top and you, at the beginning of the business, and then you work your way down. So, for us, it's Castle Day in the basics, turn up on time, you know, wear your uniform, all that sort of stuff. Then we go to taking on a property. So the first thing in a business is a landlord comes on, there's a property, tenanted or untenanted. Then we market the property, uh, carry out the viewings, tent application, uh, putting the tenant in, accounts, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's a the, it's the logical flow from A to Z, putting a tenant in. So that's like your headings, right? That, that's a real good place to start where you say, right, now I've got 20, 30 procedures. Right, let's take the first one. What do we do if a landlord comes and says, there's a property? What do we do? Like, do we just say, oh, thanks very much, get the keys and walk away? Or do we say, great, can we just take some details? And then you relate what details and forms you've got. And this is where the standardization thing happens. So if you've got multiple branches, it's the same across all the branches. So you've only got one form for, to collect data from a landlord. You haven't got, you know, branch A has got a different br to branch B. And you just literally go through each procedure bit by bit by bit by bit until you get to the end. It's time consuming and it's a pain in the bum, but it is so worth doing. You've just got to put protected time aside, two hours in the morning, two hours on the night, no phone calls during the day for whatever reason, um, and you've just got to get on with it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. How do you present it to your staff in what format? Uh, right, so we started off um, as in just a, a physical paper procedure. Can I, can I answer that question with the training development? Because it's, it's really relevant actually. It's a good, Reminders on, it's a good question. Um, because everybody's got different learning styles. So I won't bore you with something called Kolb's learning cycle, which takes about how people take in different information and at what point of the process you actually uh, retain it. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that sharing part, which is actually now, funny enough. <laughs> uh, first thing is you develop a leadership centric or leadership powered business. So the blonde girl, Adele, who, who works for me, runs, runs the business, runs Castle Day Sales and Lettings. Um, she came from, like she was basically a custom facing role. Um, she grew throughout the business, became a, a branch manager very, very quickly, an area manager. And then a couple of years ago, we said, right, you can be, uh, would, would you be managing director? Effectively, a role didn't change much. It was more of a title. Um, but it gave that, that leadership in the business that everybody now knew that she was the, the managing director. You can't help the way, way you learn, but you can help the way you teach. So the best teachers, if you think back to your school, weren't the ones that just stood up here and spouted, you know, about the Tudors at you. It was the people that got you engaged, got your attention. It's not their fault, it's not your fault for not, for not taking in my information. It's my fault for not making it interesting and engaging enough. And understand your staff. Now, I know you're Matt's big on emotional intelligence, but if you can, we are too, if you can understand your staff, and they can understand you. Do you think you're going to get more out of them? Absolutely. It's massive. If anybody wants to learn about emotional intelligence, you know, I know Matt's running a course, so speak to him about that. Um, but emotional intelligence has been a massive thing for us. We don't call them branch managers, we call them branch leaders. And we actually hire them on their, on their emotional intelligence. Uh, my last degree, I wrote a dissertation on it, and I've just signed up for a master's, and I'm doing my emotional intelligence uh, dissertation on that because I'm so passionate about how to get the best out of your staff. It's the way you communicate as well. So I'm a, if you go to the disc profile on a communication profile, I'm what's called a red, very northern, direct, you know, I just need the facts and figures. So one of the girls who looked after my property portfolio 
you used to come in on a Monday and say, how was your weekend? How was the kids? And how was that? And did you watch the football? And I'm tearing my hair out. Just give me the friggin' answers I wanted. But putting a smile on my face and pretend, yeah, 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 that's great, great. Once we did this, you just saw a light bulb switch. You went, John doesn't care what he did at the weekend, does he? No, no, he doesn't. This is like one of my managers to her. Right, she'd come in, she'd say, right, that tenant's done this, that tenant's done that, bam, 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 right, I'm off. And all of a sudden, our relationship got loads better, and I was actually going to her saying, how was your weekend, Julie? How was everything? <laughs> because I got the information I wanted on the Monday morning. Right, I'm not going to um, focus on this a lot, but there's a, there's a strategy called, a coaching method called the Grow Strategy by a chap called John Whitmore. Um, and this is just how we coach our... I'm, I'm a shite coach. I'm an even worse manager. But I employ better managers and coaches than, than me. I class myself as the leader of the business. So I don't, um, the staff know a lot more about this than me, but a grow the grow strategy is really good to get the best out of your staff, coach them. It's all about setting the goals, setting the reality, and you know, finding the options and agreeing the options together and getting the best out of them. So if you want to do a bit more research on the grow uh, coaching strategy, I suggest you do that. Now this one is really interesting. So there's a chap called Ken Blanchard who wrote The One Minute Manager. Anybody heard of that? Really good set of books. Um, he's systemised that because what he does is he gets, because he's made a name for himself, he gets other people to write the books and he just puts his name on it and gets half the royalties. I think that's pretty clever. Um, so he, he wrote one, uh, he's wrote a lot of them, but in one of them he talks about situational leadership. And what's important to know about that is you have not got one style of leadership, you've got several styles of leadership and you adapt your leadership style to the situation in the staff member or in this case the team that you're trying to lead. So if you look on this, you can be direct, you can coach, you can be supportive or supervised, or you can delegate. Right? Now on the other side, a chap called Bruce Tuckman um, talked about form and storm and norm and performing. Anybody heard about that? Yeah, and it's the formation of a team, and at what point in the team's journey are you form and storm and norm and performing? Now, what I did is I put the two together, and there's definitely a correlation between the team has just formed. Right? You've just started a branch out, you've hired your staff in, or you've got a current branch and you've had to do a bit of recruitment process. You've gone into sales where you were just letting us before. You're bringing some sort of strategy in and you're hiring the staff. You can't, you can't delegate to a new team. If you delegate to a new team, so it's all going to get done. But similarly, if you've got a performing team, you can't direct them or micromanage them. You've got to trust them and let them go. If you've got the systems in place, you can afford to let them go and you've got the confidence in yourself to let them go and run, run that business. Does that all make sense? I know I've literally just gone into theory and corporate crap from nowhere, but this, this really does work. And if you're just mindful of it, and you just, when you're talking to your staff member and you're asking them to look after a new project or a new process or whatever, if they're brand new to it, then you might have to actually direct them a little bit. If they're a manager and they've been there 10, 15, 20 years and they know their onions, then you might just have to delegate to it. The worst thing you can do is direct or, or micromanage somebody who's really pretty efficient. That is demotivating in its own right. So auditing. How are we doing for time, Chris? Am we getting the shepherd's hook yet? Oh, oh he's not here, great. <laughs> Two hours left. So auditing. So has anybody got a guess why I put UC and Bolt up for auditing? How do you think you audit UC and Bolt? Time. Simple as that. So what is the point of running a race as fast as you can, running your pluck out, I said pluck by the way, running your pluck out and then just saying, great, do you want to do it again? You've got to give somebody that aim, that goal to make sure that they, they've done a good job and giving somebody a time in this case or auditing your business to say you followed that process really well, absolutely fantastic, or you haven't, you've made a mistake, this is what we need to do about it. There's no point having systems, there's no point spending the time on training the staff if literally at the end of it you go away and then you come back. You need to audit the business to let them know what they've done well or what they haven't done well. You do what you're supposed to do. Literally, if your aim is to do that, auditing will let you know have you achieved your aim. So you have you followed your procedures. Monitors internal controls, so we have a lot of legislation in our business, haven't we? A lot of legislation. And we've got a lot of internal controls. You know, things like data protection, uh, little things you might not think about, such as petty cash. You know, handling client money. Internal controls, having audit in the business, will allow you um, to make sure that you're on the right side of compliance, the right side of legislation. Makes us more efficient. 
Again, if you're training the staff, you wrote, you wrote the manual, you're training the staff, you're going in the business, are they being as efficient? Are they following the manual like they're supposed to? And are they being as efficient as what they could and should be? If they follow the manual word for word, you will have a kick-ass business. If you've written the manual, like with customer service in mind, profitability in mind, etc., etc., like we spoke about in the beginning, and they are following your manual, you will have a kick-ass business. Auditing will allow you to ensure that you have got that type of business, because you can pick up any problems, any issues really, really early on. What you don't want is a deposit not to be registered, and then you don't audit the business, and then two years, three years later, you get these ambulance chases, these vultures, coming back and saying I want three times the amount. If you audit the business on a monthly basis, you're pretty much going to pick up every single audit or um, deposit or compliance issue. Eliminates poor performance and waste. You don't want crap stuff. You don't want people who aren't following your vision, they're not representing your brand in a positive way, you know, the poor customer service. You don't want that in your business. Auditing the business, and we audit everything. We've got, um, I don't know who's been to our, our branch, we've got, you know, big TV screens with KPIs, the telephones, you know, how many's answered within a five second ring, all that sort of stuff. We've got all our calls are recorded and Adele and the managers go through 5% of all the calls on a monthly basis. Auditing the business will weed out all the poor performers or you can improve the poor performers. Because you know, we're not, we don't want robots. We don't want people, you know, 24 seven think about property. That would be a really, really boring, boring business to work in. But you do need people that are committed to excellence. You need people that are committed to following your vision or your values. So for instance, our values are be better. That's all we want, we want our staff to be better. It doesn't mean it's not good enough, it just means that are they better tomorrow than what they were today? Are we better today than what we were yesterday? And so long as we can see that progression, that improvement in the business, I'm happy with that. I don't want everybody to be absolutely brilliant on day one, we just need to progress them. And it makes staff accountable and prevents fraud. So uh, we had that business that we bought for a quid and we sold it um, down in Halifax and we had a manager there. The reason we saw it was we went through about five branch managers in about a year, it was a nightmare. And one of the branch managers there um, was saving money. And we, we found out because one of the apprentices said, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable with this. Um, there's a bit of money going, I'm doing the banking, blah, blah, blah. So we found that out, we did a, um, and the reason we found out was because of the KPIs. So the KPIs stated that we should have X amount of income for X amount of uh, properties that we let out. And it was a little bit down. So we did an audit straight away. And we found out it was about 1,200 quid down. So we phoned up the branch manager and we said, we think there's money missing. She went, yeah, I've taken it. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah, she said, um, yeah, um, how much do you think I've stolen? It doesn't work like that. You just give back what you've taken. We thought it was 1,200 quid, she'd give back, uh, no, we thought it was 1,200 quid and she'd give back 1,500 quid. Um, obviously, you know, it's gone straight away, West Yorkshire Police involved. But it was because of the KPIs in the business that alerted us and we could do the audit. And that happened within a 48 hour, it was a whirlwind mind. There was no sleep by anybody, it was, it was crazy. But we found out in our business because of KPIs and the audit sort of cemented that. If we didn't have that audit, we wouldn't be able to pick that up. Feedback. So the feedback loop, it keeps people on track. So you've done the audit, wrote the manual, trained the staff, they're awesome. You're rolling it to individual learning styles, etc. You do the audit, now what do you do with it? Do you put it in a drawer and forget about it? No. You give them feedback on the audit. Keep them in the feedback loop. Tell them what they've done well, tell them what they haven't done well, and what they can improve on. It will improve an individual performance because if they know what they're doing wrong, they can put it right. Does anybody know, or does anybody research like motivational theory, or does anybody sad like me, or is it just me? Just me again, uh, again. You know, I've done this talk about a thousand times and nobody's as sad as me when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Aldefer, Hertzberg, Adam's equity theory, totally all sad. If you look at them all, over the years, they've all come up with theories. And what motivates people, Maslow called it self-actualization, achievement, attainment, ambition. Guess what? Being better. It's progressing slowly but surely. It's going along that journey, getting better tomorrow than what they are today. And you can see why our values are be better. So it all links into everything. Now that doesn't mean promotion, 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 promotion. All that means is a little bit more responsibility. A new process that you take control and you take accountability for, you take ownership of. Just not being mundane, mundane, mundane. Just giving them something that they can focus on and they can get better on. So short term projects is really good for staff. 
So if you're bringing in a new strategy or you're writing a procedure or new software, just give them that. So we've, we've gone with fixed flow a couple of months ago and I said to one of the branch managers who was, who was really good, she's, she's absolutely fantastic as a manager, she was getting a little bit antsy and you could just feel in a one-to-ones that something wasn't right and Adele was feeding back to me that she was, oh, you know, I don't know if she's going to last the course. We just give her a couple of procedures to write, she's absolutely kicking it out. She's really focused, she's really determined, just because we give her that little bit more accountability and ownership of a process and a procedure. Find out, what fix, find out about fixed flow, let's write the procedure, process, roll it out, train the staff. I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse, but she's absolutely took it and she's run with it and that, that's what's motivated her, because we're progressing it as a person. So if you can imagine if everybody is fully motivated, everybody is, is really engaged in the business, do you think your business as a whole is going to improve? Absolutely. It's really, really going to drive performance up like that on an individual and a company basis. You help retain staff. We're very proud of the fact that we've never lost a single staff member in nine years and 50 staff to another letting agent. We sacked them and they've gone, but that's a completely different story. We've never left them because I thought the staff was, the, the grass was greener. Because we put so much development into our staff. Training development. I mean, we, we've got a CPD, we're a CPD accredited centre, so all our staff, if they do our accreditation, our internal procedures, can use that for their ALA. So we made sure that all our procedures were as, as uh, focused and as training specific as possible. We're also a Chartered Management Institute accredited centre. So our, we were that disillusioned with other training providers, we, we started our own up. So we deliver NVQs to our staff, we deliver foundation degrees and management and leadership to our staff. And we put them on those types of courses and that's what motivates them and it's staff retention. If you're developing your staff and training your staff, they'll stick with you for, forever. Now don't get me wrong, you're going to get some people that chase the shiny penny. If you're paying them £25,000 and someone comes and pays them 50000 quid, you've got to take it on the chin and say, right, we can't compete with that. But in the main, if you can develop and train your staff and help motivate them, keep them motivated, they will stick with you, they will stay with you. Everybody all right with that? Any questions? Seagull management. Flies in, makes a lot of noise, shits on everything, then flies away again. That's basically a seagull manager. Who's had seagull managers before? It's a nightmare, especially if you're the one being managed. They fly in, they, like I say, they poop everywhere, tell you off, you crap, you crap, you crap, and then they go. How the hell do you motivate staff like that? It's absolutely impossible. So don't be that manager, don't be that guy. Next one, shit sandwich. Give them bad news, good news, bad news. Has anybody had that before? So there's a chap called Von Bergen wrote a, uh, an article called um, a sandwich feedback. He didn't use the word shit. Uh, sandwich feedback, not very tasty. So if anybody wants to read that, it's a riveting read. Um, but what he says is, if you give that sort of feedback, it says more about you as a manager than it does the person because you're not that confident as a manager or a communicator to deliver negative news. Does that make sense? So a lot of people are doing it for them, they're not doing it for the person, and when you give feedback, it's not about you, it's about the person. You think good, bad, good. Yeah, good, bad, so, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's sandwiched in the middle, so it's like, um, you know, you did this very well, you, shit, you did this very well, and it also makes that the person um, you're logically again, you tend to remember the last thing rather than the second last thing that you've spoken about. So the person being given the feedback can't focus on the middle bit, which is the bit you need to bloody improve. So it's absolutely pointless. So just be, so we're going to go over how you should give feedback. So make sure it's balanced. If you do something well, tell them. If you don't, you've got to tell them. Be open and honest. Don't sugarcoat it. Make sure everything is backed up with facts. Be clear, leave nothing uncertain. So uh, when I used to work for um, a foundry, uh, we used to make cast, think, MRI scanners and what have you. And I, was, I used to get feedback of my manager and I used to go out of that thinking I was pretty good. And then I'd read the feedback sheet and I think, was he, is that meant to be for me? Like I've got like 20 things I need to improve on but he never mentioned it or I genuinely thought he was talking about somebody else when he used to get the feedback. Um, but make sure nothing is uncertain. If you go in there with a specific focus or a specific topic you want to talk about, especially for improvement, make sure you talk about it, but back it up with facts and evidence. There's nothing worse than going into a feedback, as I said at the beginning of the talk, I feel, I believe, 
you haven't had a good month. Go in with your KPIs, your metrics, your audits. Make sure you can go in with what your findings of your audit and, and you know, give the feedback that way. Factual and precise. And make sure it's helpful as well. So use helpful language. You know, this is what we can do to improve. How do you feel you can improve? What do you need from me to make you a better person, a better sales negotiator, a lens negotiator? Are you getting the tools you need to improve in your job? Be positive about it and find a way out. And this is where that grow coaching method comes in. You're looking at the options and the way forward. The last one is review. So you've given them the feedback, right? Now you need to review it. Brutal honesty is needed here because it's your business, it's your baby. You probably do spend more time at work than you do at home, a lot of you. So you're very, very emotionally attached to your business. And I can understand that because I am as well. So you need to take a step back out and say, right, something's not gone right, something's gone wrong. Why? Make sure it's backed on facts and figures. Is it a staff issue or is it a process issue? If it's a staff issue, it's a skill or a will, right? If it's a skill, it just train them. You go back to the loop, to the training development, and you train them again. If it's a will, then it's a motivational issue, and they've chosen not to do something, and that's when you need to have a sit-down talk, and the motivational theme is what we are speaking about. And also, you've got to adapt and evolve or change the process. So if something doesn't go well, or the audit, the audit highlights it, don't be proud and say, right, I can't adapt the process because I wrote it. I can't listen to feedback from my staff because uh, you know, I'm the gaffer, I'm the boss of the company. Adapt and evolve the process to suit where you want to take the business.